Hello, welcome. Getting a few more. Hello, Reagan. Hi, Tom. Is it Tom or Thomas? Yes. Both. All right. <laughs> I invited some of my colleagues who teach astronomy, so I hope they come. That's great. Yeah. All right. I'll be right back. Okay. A few more. Hello, everyone. Janet, it's so good to see you. Another happy Friday meeting, right? Yeah, so uh, around Harper, I'm still known as the new Janet. 
Ah. Why are they calling you? That, that's a swear word. Why are you calling me that? <laughs> Maggie was hired the year I retired. Yeah, I took her spot. And then Reagan. Reagan. Then Reagan was next. Actually, uh, Sam Levinson slid in the door before Reagan did. Oh, okay. He got hired in as the nanotechnology professor, and then they closed the program, and they're like, well, he's got tenure. We got to get, we got to put him somewhere. And we're like, yay. There's a lot of people teaching physics because there's such a big demand because of the uh, collaboration with UI, University of Illinois at Urbana, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the astronomer now? Why isn't he or she here? They're coming. They are Ooh. coming. Yeah, okay. uh, Bosker Morthy. Oh, that's um, right, Bosker. I remember Bosker. Bosker. And, uh, and oh. Kevin should, and I think Kevin's coming too, Kevin Cole. Kevin, okay. Yeah, they probably do more and know more than I do, so that's okay. I have a couple more links that I can throw in the mix if somebody's interested. Reagan, I like your checklist for physics. I used to do that for a while with labs. Um, it really makes grading much more consistent and easier. Yeah. Yes, it's a trick I learned in learning how to teach high school. Good stuff. Yeah. yeah, my students complain about all my rubrics sometimes. I got that once on a SO on an SOI. There's all these rubrics, and if you miss one thing, and I think what they were really complaining about was everything is so well defined that they can't argue about points that they lose. I'm changing the topic. I want to know what's on Tom's shirt. Oh. Okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is so good. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been going through my supply of science nerd joke t shirts in, <laughs> in quarantine. You might beat Theo for best dress today. I think <laughs> I so. Know. I think he's got me. Hey, I don't think anybody has a Gorn holding a beer. Uh, oh, holding a beer keg up over their head and playing a card game on their shirts, though. Wow. Um, yeah, I certainly <laughs> see to the Gorn. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere, somewhere is in my, um, in my dresser drawer still, I have a, I, I, I call it my, my um, nerd type test shirt because it's a, um, it's a picture of um, a whale falling to the ground saying, I wonder if it'll be friends with me. And I know what kind of nerd you are if you look at the shirt and then you ask me, where's the bowl of petunias? And don't worry if you didn't get that joke. Just go out, go, go and rent and, and go and uh, get yourself a copy of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for quarantine reading. Get all five or six books of the trilogy. Well, I want to be wherever David Everett is. It looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's actually very nice outside at my house for once. That I was I was up late last night getting more imagery. As a matter of fact, the it's the first night we've had in probably three or four weeks that was worth going out for for astronomy so short on sleep this but this is sunny california yeah all right jeff i'm gonna i'm gonna make you a host so you can share your screen if you need to later oh, on sure. here yes i have things queued up and ready to go. So yeah, I, I have a, a few things to share. Like I said, I, I got some, a few new images last night. I have no, no time to process, process them yet, but you know. And it was sort of a new 
telescope, well, new overall telescope setup. It was the stuff I managed to grab from the observatory before they shut campus down entirely. Mm -hmm. So cobbling together the spare parts was a large part of last night. <laughs> That's what duct tape is for. Right, right. Oh, I think I have made a miscalculation. I made you the, the, the oh, I can reclaim this. Okay, I know how to do this now. I'm figuring out all the ins and outs of, of Zoom still. My poor students are like, you still don't know how to do that? <laughs> well, there's 8,000 different options. Um, I, I found Zoom really overwhelming in terms of trying to get things going quickly. I actually ended up punting. We have a different, um, we have a different streaming option, something called Big Blue Button that integrates just seamlessly with uh, Canvas, which is the uh, learning management system that we use. Um, but <laughs> I feel like a horrible person. It gives us a little notice saying, if more than 10 people are trying to use this at the same time at your institution, you might run into slowdown. So I've kind of been having everybody on the back being like, yeah, you, you keep going with, with Zoom. You keep going with Zoom. That you know, because uh, that way I'm getting the big blue button all to myself and don't have to worry about the whatever bandwidth limitations that other service has. Yeah, we, we had that, that same option. And essentially the, the distance education people said, yeah, if we even get, a few people trying to use it, it it'll cr it'll crash it. So don't. So I decided to be nice. It's worked, but I, they're I guess they're looking into that because it does integrate into how to expand that because it does integrate with Canvas so nicely. Oh yeah. Well, we're up to about uh, twenty participants. It looks like maybe we're what is it? Three minutes after our official start time. That's almost on time. That's a pretty good for me. Um, the astronomy Zoom meeting. Um, I don't know who has seen, but I saw the official announcement today that the 2020 summer meeting is going to officially go virtual. AAPT is going to be virtual this summer. No, no in-person meeting in Michigan anymore. So details forthcoming, I guess, but that's the official word from, from the AAPT office. Uh, I think that's about it there. Uh, we're going to be continuing these Friday meetings. I think there, I think there are at least two more already scheduled. If you can think of things that you'd like to contribute, I'm, uh, I'm sure that we'd be glad to hear from you. Contact myself or, or Glenda. I see Glenda is, is on. Yeah. Um, and tell us what, tell us what you'd like to do like to do or like to talk about even if you just have a good idea for a topic that's at least somewhere to start um, and uh, I don't know whose idea astronomy was but it's it's now well, it's now my uh, meeting I suppose so why don't I show you what I have mostly I've kind of like I said last week I've, I've really focused on how do we get uh, sort of astronomical uh, viewing experiences to happen in any sort of good way virtually. And uh, right now I've kind of concentrated on, on looking back into the archives and generating some new, uh, some new images for use. And I put together a little presentation so I wouldn't look completely unprepared. So let me attempt the share, the sh screen sharing here. Uh, this one, I think. Yeah, there we go. Um, and let me get my notes out here somewhere. There we go. Here's what I got. There, there is an actual photo of the Jackson Davis Observatory in Carson City, of which I am the director. Um, 
the it you know we've got a viewing patio that you can kind of see and uh, somebody conveniently had their uh living room lights on and when the star trail picture was taken by one of the volunteers um but that's that's what it looks like in carson city um and where we usually do a lot of our business i haven't been there in about three weeks i don't think um i did shut up set up a, a sharing a, a google shared google drive folder um here's the link this is also posted on the uh, uh on the the resources page that on the the uh, two-year college AAPT website that we've been promoting for a while. Glenda has been uh, generously donating her time to, to get done. And uh, I have some examples of some images that I've got. This is an, a little bit older picture. Anybody recognize the double star, Alberio? One of the few objects in the night sky that you, you really can look through a telescope and see this color difference between these, between these two stars. Um, kind of exciting and, and cool to, to bring up discussions of different types of stars. This is probably an optical double as they're probably far separated. We don't really know that for sure, but yeah, we're guessing. Um, so there's that, that, uh, f that folder where I'm sharing things. It'll be, uh, I'll keep populating it with more and more. You're free, anything that's in there, feel free to use for whatever the, good of humanity to you know put a cool picture on your website doesn't matter free to use that's that's what we do um, I've got a few things um, feel free to ask me for specific objects I do have a few Andromeda pictures that's the picture on the left here um, this was actually taken this is a, a, a mosaic of a, a, just a horizon picture um, a I guess former volunteer who moved back to India took this in India and sent it to me where he'd labeled all these different objects in the night sky kind of look in one particular direction. I thought it was a cool photo. Uh, and it, it's kind of uh, eye opening for students to say, you know, yeah, it just looks dark up there, but take a look at what's really in there. If your eyes were just better light detectors, you'd, you'd have a lot to see. Um, those are the kind, those are some of the, the things that I've been looking for in our archives. Um, but uh, also the, the specific things like, and feel free to send me an email, thomas.herring at wnc.edu and ask me, hey, I really want a, a, a nice image of whatever object. Uh, some can get some, some nice ones. And I have a, a small uh, core of volunteers who actually have nice backyard observatories that are, that are working on this as well. Um, I've also got some videos. Let me see if the video will play. I'm not sure. Now, uh, doesn't doesn't look, oh, there it goes. Here's the video. Can you see the asteroid going through the frame there? This was actually a close pass in uh, 2017, the 1st of September, um, asteroid Florence that, that came real close to, to hitting us. So I like to play that one and show people. That's, that's really what you see with the asteroid close pass is um, another bright dot that moves really fast compared to the other bright dots. It's, it's, again, less exciting than students might think, but um, a little bit more uh, enlightening as to how astronomers actually actually work on things. Um, we also have an all sky camera. Uh, I, so I can get some pictures here. This is a little video I made of, you can see the rotation of the galaxy and clouds and a whole bunch of airplanes whizzing, whizzing by. Uh, we're close enough to the Reno Tahoe airport that you see the little streaks in the sky as airplanes. Um, and right at the very end of this video, um, it was actually the morning of Thanksgiving last year and a snowstorm rolled into Carson City. So watch for the storm right at the very, very end. Uh, but we did have pretty clear skies. Here it comes. Wiped out the views. Um, the all sky camera is still running at the observatory so I can get some recent images uh, in the next week or so. I'll be able to, to, to get into that, that system and start downloading images. Uh, I did put another picture from the All Sky camera over here on the left. That right there is a nice bright fireball. That's a meteor that came in and was detected by not just our camera but a whole bunch of others. And we, all, we also have another camera that's the part of the Desert Fireball Network for detecting uh, uh, these these bright objects that are likely to hit the ground. 
uh, a NASA project. But um, there's some cool things like that that you can really see what does it really look like. This is a 30 second exposure and you can see how far that thing went in 30 seconds across the sky. Uh, these are the kind of images that I'm that I'm trying to get out there to share with people. Uh, I do also have solar filters. I, I managed to find the uh, hydrogen alpha filter set and brought home with me. I haven't set it up yet, but um, this is the sun. And I took this as a pretty boring picture of the sun, but there is one sunspot. If you can see my pointer right there. And so uh, I can get images of the sun as well. And, and hopefully uh, if I can get the hydrogen alpha filter uh, set, uh, com completely uh, calibrated, uh, I'll be you'll be able to see prominences and things like that as well. So be sure to to ask me about solar images as well. The recent one, Tom. Is this a recent picture? Uh, this one is about six months ago. The sun has been rather quiet of late. Uh, there have not been many sunspots. Uh, so. We're fingers crossed, I'm hoping for something exciting to happen so that I'll have some solar astronomy to do. It's slightly more comfortable to do solar astronomy it's during the day, it's a little bit warmer, you know, kind of nice. Do you have a tunable filter to catch Doppler effects? Uh, maybe, <laughs> yeah, the, the answer is the hardware, yes calibration to trust that we get good data not really <laughs> so so i'm working on that um and then I'm, just, relaying, I'm relaying uh, questions from the chat ah yeah I, I i don't have the tunable filter working yet but it, it does exist um i'm hoping that in in the next uh three or four weeks i'll get some more i'll get some more access to our bigger telescopes in the observatory and be able to expand this project a little bit but um just last night out from my, you know, my uh, front yard outside the garage, I got this picture of, of the Whirlpool galaxy. This was just uh, my DSLR camera on the back of the telescope. So this was sort of a quick one off. That's, that's uh, all of about two minutes of clicking the auto fix buttons in, in, uh, in Lightroom to, to try some quick adjustments. That's not really very processed. Uh, just a little bit, but I can get pretty quick images of relatively bright objects like this. Uh, most of the Messier objects that are that are up at night right now are, are easy to get. We're building up a catalog of those as well. Um, there are quite a, quite a few, and uh, I hope to get more and more. And then here are a few more examples of stuff that I have in the archive. Uh, you might recognize some of these. Uh, the my favorite globular cluster in Hercules everyone's favorite nebula pretty much m42 um this is this bottom picture right here this was uh january 31st 2018 there was a lunar eclipse uh and locally it was, it was pretty but the the sun actually set behind the to the west behind or the the sun the moon set to the west behind the sierras before the eclipse was over so you can see some of the trees at the top of the hill sticking up in the way Kind of a neat picture. Um, these two on the right were both taken by a volunteer from his backyard observatory about three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, the the top one is the uh, is a spiral galaxy NGC forty five sixty five, uh, and he's he's building up a, a a catalog of particularly spiral galaxies. That's been his project of late, and uh, then he caught Comet Atlas. Which is still visible if you can uh, if you can get clear skies. Um, uh, it's it does not set, so if you get clear night skies in the northern hemisphere, you should be able to catch it um, as long as there's not a hill or something in the way. And even with a pretty modest backyard telescope, you can see a little fuzzball. You don't need image imagery Im imaging to to catch Comet Atlas. Um, it's about a magnitude six or something like that. So. In, in any, pretty much any backyard telescope should be able to catch Comet Atlas for the next few weeks anyway. The, this is the kind of stuff that I'm trying to put together. Uh, I would encourage all of you to send me some requests about uh, what you would like to see more of and what I can, what I can provide. Uh, since, since I still have at least some equipment at home and uh, the 
prospects of opening up the the big scopes in the next few weeks are looking are looking better. So uh, let me know what you need, and I can probably get something arranged. Let me get um, out of here. A, a quick question, if I if I yeah. could. Um, you know, so are all of these images coming from DSLR, or are some of them coming? Are the actual like multi-filter images? Uh, some of them are DSLR. Some of them are are multi-filter images. The it, like in this last batch of examples, the M13 is a is a an a luminance red, green, blue fil four filter filter set from our the our big 16 inch telescope. Um, and similarly, the 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 it's there's not much color to it, but that picture of Comet Atlas is really a, an RGB uh, filter set image from uh, the uh, Jim Bazanek, my volunteer's backyard. CCD telescope. Uh, some of them are DSLRs, some of them are, are, are suitable CCD images. And uh, I do have, a, I do have a, at least one little CCD camera here. I took a bunch of pictures with it last night that might be suitable for image analysis, but uh, I have not even had the chance to look at them. I've got uh, some, some pictures of, uh, of M42 just, just for kicks, and then I got uh, uh, a few other things, galaxies and 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 whatnot, and possibly even some video. We'll see how the video comes out. Uh, where I had to wait for last night for clear skies, um, the the video project has been stalled until just now. Uh, but uh, I I will probably be posting some kind of observation videos with this little black and white CCD camera that can do some some frame grabbing and stack it stack videos, which is is kind of nice um, when it when it stacks those when it when it's it stacks up a bunch of frames it can make you know to get a 10 second video it takes something more like a minute and a half but you can get a little 10 second video of that kind of shows that that it brings out that experience of looking through an eyepiece a little bit where you can see some atmospheric effects and and things like that uh, so look for some videos to show up in that shared folder in the next three or four days. Right. Well, or, or, or the flip side to that, right? You can do some lucky imaging, right? With the multiple frames. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I did, I did capture uh, with a few things I, I, I captured, you know, on the order of a hundred or so pictures to, to try and, and uh, do some, some lucky imaging shot. And some of the longer videos uh, are suitable for that as well to you with various that's a software that are pretty much all free. Uh, things like Deep Sky Stacker, uh, Registax. Uh, uh, there are others, I'm sure, that I'm not thinking of right now. So that's what I, that's what I've been working on the past, kind of the past few weeks, but really mostly last night because. Finally got some clear skies. Uh, fingers crossed for more of that. Uh, let me turn over to Jeff. And uh, he's got some resources regarding online astronomy in particular to share. Yeah, so, um, so, so thanks, Thomas. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, let me get share screen going over here. So I've got a couple of things actually uh, to, to share. Mm, there we go. So the first is, um, are y'all seeing a big just canvas page website thing? Just some head nods. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I'm able to, I'm using something that I had started experimenting with in a prior quarter um, that it's actually kind of turning out to make my life a lot easier with the transition to fully online lab. Um, with my lab classes, I've already been making heavy use of Stellarium, the, the sort of this, the old guy simulator and I've written up labs where the students simulate, go, simulate going out and watching the sky for, uh, you know, 30, 50 years and to uh, to do pattern finding to notice things like oh hey some of these things appear to move across the sky uh sort of stuff and 
And so one of the issues that I had been running into with this was that, um, I, you know, I was always trying to find ways to tighten the feedback loop, especially in the early stages of labs where there's a lot of just making sure that they've learned how to use the software, making sure that they have noticed the thing that they need to notice to then go on and try to figure out, right? Because, uh, for example, with my second lab, um, you know, there's, you know, this big puzzle that I try to set up, which is why do stars rise four minutes earlier every day? But if somebody's not being particularly careful with observing, they're not going to notice this, right? They're just going to be like, yeah, I saw the star rise. <laughs> and, and it, you know, they'll only notice a difference after a month or more. And so, so in order to sort of tighten the feedback loop to make sure that everybody is developing the skills that they need to then go on and do the interesting stuff, I started writing up these little practice pages where as they would be working along, they could basically hop in and check their work, right? So like, there's a section in this lab where I'm asking a series of questions to kind of uh, coach them through figuring out which way the Earth spins, right? So if we see things rising in the east and setting in the west, which way must the Earth be spinning? And so then at the end of that section, it's like, okay, let's make sure that you have really figured this out because everything later is really not going to make any sense if you've not understood this. And so, you know, so the students can hop in, they can, you know, I have a set of questions that are basically just doing these spot checks to see have they correctly measured whatever they need to, to have in their, to, whatever they need to have noticed now to be able to do the, the more interesting stuff later. And I found when I was doing this with my face to face classes that this changed a lot of the discourse that students were having with each other from just what's the answer to it shifted the questions that I have heard them asking each other to wait a minute, why was it this? And they were getting into um, having this ability to sort of check for themselves to see what the right answer is was then getting them to focus more on the why it is. And I'm glad that I started this experiment in my face-to-face -face classes uh, because it's, it's actually, we're only into the second week of the spring quarter here. Um, but already so far, I have found that this has just totally been saving my, saving my lab courses because, um, you know, in person, I could still do a lot of monitoring just by kind of standing there and just listening in on five conversations at once. And just walking by, looking over shoulders, and getting a sense of, okay, they're, they're basically figuring this out, or, oh, wow, they're totally off in left field. And I totally can't do that now, <laughs> right? The transition time for going into a breakout room and back out, right, you know, taking 30 seconds for the system to put me in to, to look over their shoulders um, sort of thing. And so, um, okay, I'll get to your question in a moment, Phil. Um, the, and so having this ability for the students to be checking their progress as they're working through has been really nice. Um, so there's this question that came up is uh, about, have I had problems with students saying they cannot install or run Solarium? Um, I recognize that this would be an issue, especially for Mac, uh, because with uh, everything from Mac off 10.12 upward, you have to actually disable the security settings on your computer, install Solarium, and then reactivate your, your security settings. And um, because I, I don't know what it takes to go get involved in the Mac app store, but the folks doing Solarium can't do that process. So, um, so yes, there have been problems. And the, so for the students, right this is the big issue because they're working from home they all need to have they they all need to have Solarium working on some machine at their home and so I started three weeks four weeks before the quarter so basically as soon as students had re were registering for lab I was emailing the registered students saying hi welcome to the lab 
we need to start working on this right now because this is going to be a huge pain in the butt, but let's get this, this done and we'll be happy. And so it was, a, there was a huge amount of overhead with doing this. I was basically spending an hour a week for four weeks emailing students saying, hi, I haven't heard any, I have not heard back from you yet about Solarian install. Please try this and let me know how it goes. And then another hour or so bouncing emails around with people who are having trouble. But it totally paid off because on day one, it just ran. Everybody had already, um, we had either gone through the steps of um, the security settings business. I found a nice set of instructions for this actually on Aperture Photometry Tool. So the Aperture Photometry Tool, the, the different uh, software package, they have a nice FAQ with a walkthrough of how to open up the terminal, type your, type your sudo, um, which is nerve wracking to be for me to be telling uh, computer novices to be using uh, to to be using super user mode. Um, so I'm like, please do everything on this list. This last step where you reactivate security, this is really important. But it worked out. Um, and so, um, so, so yeah, so so that's what we ended up doing for people with the Mac is I email the walkthrough saying, do all of these steps exactly as I've typed them out here. And I added in some text saying things like, so here's how to find terminal. Um, and yeah, because I have some students who had never even, you know, there's a lot of students who had, they don't even know what a, a file, uh, you know, what the file structure is, right? If you say, go to this folder, they're like, oh, what? And so, um, you know, very much broken it down to imagine that somebody is seeing a computer for the very first time. Um, I, I was just trying to remind myself of that scene from Star Trek IV where Scotty's picking up the mouse, computer, right? Let's see now, in the lab, yes, so in my lab instructions, I have a spot, so, so da, 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 you should still have the share screen up, right? So. So as they go along, I have a spot where it says, check your work. And in the, and then in the, um, for each lab, I'll have several of these. Because right? the first, you know, the first two thirds of any one of these labs is a lot of teaching them some basic skills, right? So, you know, like later on when we're looking at things like, you know, the phases of the moon, when we're looking at things like um, the motion of the planet, you know, for a lot of people, it's not intuitively obvious that light is traveling in straight lines from here to here, right? And that's, you know, that's the fundamental concept that you have to have to understand, you know, the phases of the moon, to understand, you know, the motion of the planet. And so two thirds of the lab is really just a lot of, you know, let's sit down and draw some straight lines and practice this skill to really get this down. Now let's go and return to those puzzles that we introduced at the beginning. Um, so then, um, and then getting back to the issue of Solarium, um, they do have, yeah, they have this online version of Solarium. It is just lacking too much, right? Like. I have a lab where at one point I'm trying to get the students to compare how many people can see a solar eclipse versus a lunar eclipse. And in the online version of Stellarium, you cannot input uh, latitude and longitude. And so you are stuck trying to just say, okay, take me to San Antonio. Okay, take me to Fredericksburg. You know, so like if you're looking at the, the 2024 eclipse and trying to use that to make estimates. Um, and, in, and in a lot of ways, it's just so much easier in, in regular Stellarium to go to the locations map and just hit up arrow one degree. Can I still see the eclipse or not? Um, and so, so the, and, and even things like um, the online version of Solarium, you click on an object and it will give you the altitude and azimuth for it. 
then you hit play and it does not update the coordinates that are being displayed on the left. <laughs> and so if you want to do anything involving, you know, finding when the object is, is at its highest altitude in the day, or even just kind of tracking the trend of the numbers to get a sense of them, you have to stop, click on the object again, stop, click on the object again, stop, click on the object again. It's, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so at any rate, um, that's, uh, that's what I have on the sort of the thing I wanted to share as far as something I found really useful for my lab classes, having these little, you know, little quizzes that they're not graded, the students can do them as many times as they want. I worried about students just going in, click, 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 submit, oh, I missed this one, click, click, click. And I've not seen that at all. Um, you know, I've really seen this do a good job of helping to drive discussion among the students about why, you know, and, and, and I, was, I was only able to put this together because I've taught these labs so many times, I know what the most common mistakes are. And so all of the alternate choices are things that, you know, a third of the students would pick their first time through. And it's led to much better work overall because people are not sort of making a mistake on part A, think, thinking that they have it right, and then doing part B, but with this mistaken idea from part A, and then going on to have to try to do part C with all of those mistaken ideas. By the end, it's just gibberish. That doesn't happen now. So anyways, I've, I've done a very long bit of just blah, blah, blah. Um, was the, the question about uh, gen ed versus courses for major or majors or gen ed, is, was that relative, was there a particular reason this was coming up or were you wanting to introduce a new topic? I just, no, I, I just, uh, yes, it would be a new topic for later. But um, uh, so you give these quizzes as they do the labs. So the quizzes yeah. are with the labs, right? And they have yeah. one, a lab per week? Yes, one lab per week. We meet for three hours uh, via live stream and putting the students in the breakout room. And the lab is mostly in the Solarium simulations, but you also have some written and pen and paper work. Yes. So, yeah, so um, like a lot of them, a big one of the skills that I'm aiming to build up is some geometric, uh, geometric reasoning skills. And so a lot of my labs have the students working with diagrams like this, where we're trying to make a connection between Here's what things look like as you're looking down on the system. And then what does that look like when you are sitting on the earth looking off in these other directions and trying to do that back and forth between the view from earth and the top down view. And so that's one of the running themes of my lab is, and, you know, and which fundamentally comes down to go draw a straight line, right? But that's not intuitively obvious to people that it's still something that has to be taught and practiced repeatedly. The question about the majors and whether uh, how many of us teach actually astronomy for majors is, is just a uh, question I have always because I see a lot of students who want to do astronomy and then come by my class but the astronomy classes they took in my college are not transferable and 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 so they are surprised and etc. So it's something I'm always trying to be aware of. And I realize even some of the faculty, they're not clear on that uh, to, the, to the students. And so, yeah, that's it. But this is, this is intra astronomy, say astronomy 101, 105, that type of thing, right? Yes, yeah, so these are astronomy. This is for astronomy classes that are aimed at general education majors. Um, but when I think back to um, when I taught majors lab, um, I, I think that I would apply the same approach, right? Because even there, a lot of it was, we have some skill that you have to build up and master, yeah. right? And, and, and there's some aspect of that that comes down to just, you need to know how to do this, then this, yeah. then this. But now you have this tool on your tool belt. And then the second half, you can focus on the, the creative match. application yeah. of those skills. I mean, that's my thought. Um, I had one other, sorry, I'm, I'm taking up a huge chunk of time here. I had another thing I wanted to share with everybody that might be useful. 
Um, but I'll, I'll make this uh, quicker than what I was saying uh, <laughs> about the uh, my lab. Um, so I'm guessing people are familiar with the um, the Nate the Nebraska Astronomy Applet. So I, ha I have that up on my share screen. So all of you know, sort of the famous, uh, you know, planetary configuration simulator and stuff. Yeah, so, so those are all done in Flash. Um, and while Kevin Lee has, as a stopgap, um, has made uh, downloadable versions of those, they're, they're still sort of executable that you have to install on a Windows machine or a Mac machine. Um, and so, you know, there's still a hurdle for them. And so uh, there are a few projects out in the wild of people make converting those existing simulations into HTML5 uh, JavaScript. There's a team at the University of Columbia. Um, so a, a, a fellow named uh, Nick Nighy has written up uh, six of them into um, into into modern framework. So like motions of the sun simulator, it'll work on your phone, it'll work on your tablet, it'll work on any modern computer. Um, you know, the moon phases, right? So this makes me very happy because I use this simulation in one of my labs. Um, and so I've also started a project here at Foothill uh, where we've been re-implementing some of these. Um, yeah, so the Nebraska lab, the problem is the development of the labs was originally done as part of an NSF education research project. Um, and nobody pay, nobody in the U.S. funds maintenance, <laughs> to put it bluntly, right? The U.S. The US as a whole has a psychological blind spot <laughs> of saying, that works great, let's not keep it working. <laughs> and so uh, uh, NSF falls for the same thing. So, um, but but I have a team here at Foothill. We just finished and released version one of our first one. Uh, so a planet. So we've we've re-implemented the planetary configuration simulator, where you can move the Earth and a target planet around the Sun and see how the view from Earth changes. So looking off at the zodiac, where does each, where does the sun appear? Where does the target planet appear? You know, you can throw on your vectors to help make the connection for people. And we made a few changes to the original. We added in a mode where you do this zoom out and you can schematically see the zodiac. Uh, so that one has gone live. We have a beta version of a uh, dark matter simulator. Up. So you, know, you can adjust your dark matter distribution and you say, oh, what happens if all the matter is centrally? As I said, it's a beta version. So I have a student right now working on making a much improved version of this, this one. Um, but you know, you can do your things like let's look at what the velocity curve looks like when you've got centrally uh, concentrated mass. Um, we've got, we are almost ready to go live with a re-implementation of the Ptolemaic system simulator. We've got all the motions working correctly now. Um, and we just are working on getting things like tracing the planet position so you can actually see the little loopy loop, um, throwing on the zodiac and stuff. Um, this one is just, and we're also developing some totally new simulations. So. I mean, like dark matter, there is no tool for teaching dark matter. Well, there wasn't a tool for teaching dark matter. Um, the same for sort of the difference between initial separation, light travel distance, current separation between objects with uh, the expansion of space, cosmological redshift. So this one is, I think, one round, one more round of edit of typo catching, and I think uh, we're ready to post this one. So uh, so at any rate, there are people in gravitational lensing. Uh, we've just gotten started on that one. And so we'll probably get another couple of these done. But basically, there are people who are 
there are people who are working on re-implementing the um, the Nate tools, and I've started making a list of re-implementations. So, like if you were using the Nebraska Blackbody Blackbody Curves tool, uh, Set has a good alternative. Um, for looking at black body radiation and you know it gives a nice representation of what it looks like to your eye um, but uh, one of the things that we're wanting to do is we're releasing our first we've just clean, cleaned up the code and done made sure we've got good commenting and stuff and we've just publicly released the code the source code for the planetary configuration simulator which if somebody if anybody has you know Right, here's the joke time. If anybody has spare time, um, you could load it up and uh, uh, you, you could load it up and uh, start modifying it, make other stuff, right? It would be a good jumping off point for like Venus phases or, um, or others. So I'm gonna stop talking now. I've been talking a long time. That's a lot of good stuff. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. And this is all linked on the the two year college page. We have the uh, we have this info up there. I think it's up there already, right, Glenda? Partially, maybe, but but boy, there's so much here. I don't know if we caught yeah. everything. Well, we, I don't know. I know. I know we've got the link to that. Um, that we've got a link to that spreadsheet that has the alternatives to things, and uh, I, I'm sure there's. A link to the I'm pretty sure there's a link to the Foothill College website that talks yeah, about and if it. People want, and if people want to get involved with re-implementing I mean we've, we've got a lot of lessons learned um, we're putting in a poster at the AAS meeting um, and so now that the AAPT meeting is going virtual it might be on my radar too <laughs> um, and so the, um, but, but yeah we're kind of hoping to just kind of be saying to people, you know, if everybody takes one of these and re-implements, then, uh, you know, there's enough of us that, you know, even if it takes a month apiece, right, all of a sudden, boom, we have the whole library redone. Uh, so as far as the language, these were all re-implemented in JavaScript, and we've made heavy use of the uh, J3 and Pixie framework. They do a nice job of kind of helping to simplify dealing with the graphics. And my students have, one of my students has put a lot of attention into trying to make sure that the code is really understandable so that people could, you know, just copy paste the whole thing and then start modifying to make other sims. Well, I, I'd like to briefly mention that uh, th that uh, there's from PCC Portland Community College. There's 30 uh, labs posted on the two-year college thing. It's uh, our classes are divided into one physics 121, 122, 123, which is solar system, stars, and galaxies, and then cosmology. So a person can uh, go to uh, the uh, uh, see there and unzip the files and there's 30 ready to go labs in all those areas. So uh, uh, I, I see Glenda's uh, evidently looking at our website there in community college. And uh, so I guess those are useful. I don't teach astronomy, so I don't know. But uh, I sent Thomas uh, two, pic two pictures from uh, the 2017 uh, eclipse that we, uh, pictures we took and verifying uh, uh, the uh, bending of light around the sun, and, and which was successful. Uh, we have, those two pictures are very interesting. I don't know uh, if anyone wanted to look at those or have those, they, it's uh, 42 stars. It's a composite of 42 stars on 20, 20 23 plates and and uh, it's quite a nice picture and we were successful and uh, just a plug for 2024 I've 
received collaboration with the Technical Institute exactly at, ha at centerline in Mexico at 9,000 feet. And uh, uh, we're gonna, uh, I'm putting together uh, many universities, hopefully we'll go down there and repeat this experiment in 2024. I'm trying to go to Argentina to improve our techniques and our, our telescope equipment. So if you're interested in doing the Eddington experiment, uh, get on board. We're going to Mexico for 2024, and I'm hoping to have 12 universities and, and their students. And su surprisingly enough, the goal is to get the air down to less than a half a percent and approach the air of the measurements of the ra radio telescopes with amateur astronomy equipment. So this is exciting, and if you want to get involved, Join in, just email me and I'll put you on the list. Yeah, Toby, I did get those pictures about uh, five minutes before the meeting started. I'll, I'll send them along to Glenda and we'll make sure that they're, that, that well, they're accessible that. to they're everybody. Very, they're very large. If, I don't know if she wants to post them, but anybody who wants them, just email me and I'll, I'll email them to them. Um, but uh, it's good a talking point because you can say it's those stars are being bent around the sun as in right in this photograph here <laughs> toby there was a question for you if you have a website or, or resources about the mexico eddington experiment and uh, that's the 20, 2024 plan right yes uh, we don't have a website uh, I'm keeping secret where this location is until I go down there this summer and sign a contract with a resort. We've got a resort with 13 cabins at 9,000 feet. I mean, we will hopefully will have, and uh, uh, it's kind of secret now because it's getting interest is raising in Mexico and the central Mexico for the this event. And so I want to get down there early, but I do have the advantage of being associated with the local institute called uh, the Technological Institute of El Salto and uh, and they're gonna give us tours of uh, the ecological forest for our students and some learning on the forest ecology and we'll teach them a little bit about astronomy so it's a great international adventure for students I hope and uh, and that's a long way off but we need to get uh, going <laughs> to if you want to do the Eddington experiment, it's about a two year learning curve. So I'm going to be doing talks at the APT meetings on how, what you need to do and how to do it. And uh, so that'll be good over the next two years. Speaking of the APT meeting, now that, that uh, Michigan is on, on hold, um, it puts the pressure on Portland. I'm the host of Portland. I did arrange uh, yesterday a tour of Hanford LIGO for the Saturday. That'll be a great tour, bus tour up the gorge and uh, dinner in the restaurant in the gorge and uh, a four hour visit. It's lucky because the LIGO is shut down at that time and that's even better because we'll be able to go and actually look into the vacuum chamber and maybe even peer at, take a close look at the mirrors. So that'll be an exciting tour of LIGO and I'm I'm getting some, I hope to get some really interesting speakers. We're look, working on uh, getting uh, this fellow named Avery Broderick from the University of Waterloo to talk on the imaging of uh, the black hole in, in M87. And I'm trying, we're trying to get Wendy, uh, Wendy, uh, let's see, I gotta remember her last name, but she, she does uh, the crisis in the Hubble constant, which is, uh, article in this issue of the physics teacher journal. So astronomy will definitely be highly uh, part of the Pro Portland meeting in January. There's someone um, volunteering to show something on Skynet for us. Yeah, let me see if I can give you screen sharing permission da, da, da. let me find you uh ha Uh, 
Okay, see if you can uh, see if you can show us Skynet. You should be able to share your screen. I think. I think something's up with your uh, with your audio. We're not getting clear audio through. And it's like frequency shifted to super high frequency or something. <laughs> yeah, so, something something is up there. Um, we can't we can't hear you what you're saying at all. We're just we're just seeing you click stuff. Uh, yeah, I I've I haven't used Skynet much, but it's if you can if you can get access, um, you can get some images. Yeah, something is something is very messed up with your. Um, is it still crowding? <laughs> a kitty cat talking. <laughs> yeah, some something's up with your microphone. So, um, just try to. Yeah, uh, Skynet is, is if you if you have some experience with remote astronomy is is not not too bad. Um, I haven't used it much because I have plenty of telescopes waiting to be used nearby me most of the time so Linda if uh, if you want to I did put that photograph I was talking about on my screen I don't know if you can screen share for me or interrupt her thing but uh, you know whatever absolutely Tom yeah, maybe let's see if we can yeah let me see if I can do that I'm gonna, yeah. Let me see if I can get Toby. Uh, I can uh, give you permission to share your screen, Toby. Was it okay? Try that now. Okay, can you see that? Oh my yes, goodness! Yeah, well, that's a that's an image of composite of uh, twenty three photographs with forty two stars in it uh, the, at different exposures. The exposures are for tw uh, one quarter of a second, one half a second, three quarters, and a second. And uh, of course, you get more and more of the corona with more exposure. And uh, these are the stars here all around. There, there. If you can't see them all, but there are forty two stars all the way around. And the advance with the modern Eddington experiment was that in the early experiments, they were looking at stars in this area and there was very few, like Eddington had seven stars on three plates. But now with the new CCDs and the CMOS cameras, we get pictures of stars at way out. And now we, and for Argentina, we're thinking of using a, greater, a wider field and we might be able to image 300 stars uh, uh, during the eclipse. So it's really exciting. And one interesting feature is the earth, moon uh, illuminated by the uh, uh, earth shine. Uh, the light reflecting from the earth hits the moon, bounces back off, and comes into our lens. And there it is, the moon <laughs> during eclipse. It gives you an idea how, how uh, sensitive these cameras are. And, and that's why the Eddington experiment can be performed now with cheap equipment and get a good result.
Thank you, Toby. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's uh, 4.56. Would you like to wrap it up with some con concluding remarks? And uh, I, I I would just say that I, I <laughs> when I found out we were going remote, one of my first thoughts was, boy, I'm glad I'm not teaching astronomy this semester because <laughs> my uh, it, it, it at least the, when I teach it, it's, it hinges upon a lot of, of person, you know, it's student time with telescopes. Um, and thinking about alternatives to that for not, not just right now, but, but in the future was, was a, something that immediately popped into my mind. And, and I think this has been a, a useful uh, gathering to, to get some, get some of those ideas and realize that it, it really can, it really can be done, um, and uh, there there are still ways to get uh, to to get good tools into students' hands, even with the usual technical challenges. How many of us here right now are teaching astronomy? Um, maybe you just put your thumbs up if you're teaching astronomy this semester. Yeah, I mm, I don't know, Tom. How many would say? About 30%? We can turn things around. I don't know. Yeah. And um, so we'll put this, I tell you, uh, I am surprised. I'm not teaching astronomy this semester, but boy, I find it wonderful to know Jeff's email. <laughs> I would email him a lot. <laughs> And use a lot of the a lot of the resources he shared. So thank you a lot. Yeah, uh, we'll post all that and we'll post everything we can. We'll post. And um, just to remind you, next Friday there is uh, a, another meeting on uh, plans for the summer, organized by Karim Diff. He's here now with us. And um, so plans, teaching plans for the summer, and more. Uh, long-range plans uh, and tools you, you plan to adopt for uh, a more permanent online teaching, right? Many of us are, are doing a temporary plan now, but things can probably need to change. So that, that's, that's going to be the focus of next meeting. Right, Karim? Yeah, that's right. Uh, what I haven't decided yet, and maybe I can get some input on that, what would be a good time for it? We've been kind of shifting back and forth a little bit, but what would be a Generally, good time for. I mean, I'm on the East Coast, but I, I can do it at any time. Going anywhere on that Friday. <laughs> you choose yeah. Kareem and tell us. Okay, all right. I'll do something. Uh, not, yeah, okay. Maybe 2, 3 p.m. East Coast. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out and send an email. Anybody who wants to, who has, well, I'll send you an email also, an invitation for maybe be a speaker for a few minutes, just if you already have figured out what you're going to do, and you can share that with us, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, we are always looking for participants. Anybody who would like to chip in, share what they have, either via PowerPoint or just uh, sharing ideas. I, I find sometimes some visual aid really helps. I'm, I'm, I'm very visual, I like it. So if there's something, I, I, I understand it better. Some visual aid. Um, yeah. Um, any other concerns, ideas that people would like to uh, raise for future meetings even, say weeks from now and things that would be good to be in line? Um, also, let me ask you anything you would like to see at the APT meeting, any ideas about how a virtual APT meeting would be good. Uh, if, if, if you would have any suggestions or anything, send our way. Uh, we do have a voice uh, to, 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 to ask uh, things about a future APT virtual meeting. So are we gonna have it on Zoom and then we all go into a Zoom link and watch that session? They have a third party. Uh, they're hiring someone to, to do all that part of the hosting and et cetera. Yeah, um, if you ever looked at the APS that has just happened last last uh, weekend and to Monday and Tuesday, there's a whole website and all hosted and all, so it's not just Zoom and all, it's 
whole scenario and apparatus different or oh, everything is different <laughs> specialized yeah but there, there is so posters people who have posters can submit their posters or can submit a five minute little presentation um so there will be options there were options for the APS people who would want to send a short video with those who just want to be live etc I don't know um we're yeah. all learning so I haven't been paying attention because I was busy with my classes, but are what what are the dates that have been uh, selected for the summer? Okay, no? so they're under discussion, but oh. um, yeah, so all these things are under discussion as well, whether it's going to be a longer meeting, a shorter meeting, or a, a, a meeting that will take more days and, and will last less hours per day, um, all that is opened um they are deciding on these things now uh, i guess a lot can be learned from the aps i don't know if anybody had uh, already seen anything about the aps meetings and seeing how they're being done janet i um i did listen in on a part of that over the weekend and um the audio was terrible that i i could not hear i had my volume turned up i had their volume turned up so um I hope that um, they got their, um, maybe it was just the sessions that I was attending. I kind of hope that they have their tech problems worked out. Um, the sessions looked very interesting. They had general sessions, uh, they had papers, they had, it was very nice. It was just like a regular meeting except virtual, but my problem was with the audio. The beats, the beats I saw were very nicely organized and they had um, so this interaction hours uh, as well between the talks. There were a lot of gaps and I guess they were all going to some kind of like here a Zoom uh, chat room um, yeah. or session. So that is interesting. I, I, I didn't see much about that. I, I don't know if I can see that now that the meeting is over, but I'll, I'll investigate. I attended some sessions too and it was pretty good. Um, I didn't really have any problems with their audio or seeing stuff. So it was pretty good, the ones I attended at APS. Will we still be able to have the committee meetings and so on as well in that yes. virtual format? Yes. Yes. Will it cost $4 or 400 <laughs> <laughs> the APS was free. Yeah, the APS was free. So at that part, I think it's uh, it's not very democratic. Someone will decide and we'll just vote. But uh, we have some input uh, on other things. <laughs> all right. Um, so thank you all for coming, Tom. Thank you so much for organizing this. Yeah, as organized as I ever am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course you are. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I'll see you next uh, Friday. And also at the uh, APT Virtual Coffee, right? They have a virtual coffee, yeah, well, uh, like they say here. Tuesday, I think, is the next one. Tuesday at 4 p.m. Yes, and there are different topics, different uh, focuses, right? Last time was a lot of high school teaching, and it was very interesting, very interesting. Um, you learn you a lot. Get on that Oh, sorry. How do you get on that? On that, that, get the link for that. I missed that email somehow. They send these emails weekly, um, okay. and they normally send one a reminder even today to, to, to Friday. They were sending okay, and, uh, it. says Beth at APT uh, from Beth Cunningham. Normally, it says that for me on those emails. It comes from the executive office officer, right? Yo. Um, so take a look and it's going to be there. Otherwise, if, if you're having any trouble accessing or receiving any of those emails, uh, let us know and we'll, we'll help. Uh, hi, Glenda. Yes, yes, please, Kai. Uh, so uh, I just have a, just found that we can, uh, can save chat today. And could you save the uh, chat, um, like send to everyone because uh, Zoom seems to be. Uh, yeah, it's the new off. default setting for Zoom to, to disable most things, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm I'm finding out the harder to, but I'm I'm sure I can save it since I'm the original scheduler host, and we'll put it on the the TYC site. Um, Thank you. Uh, 
to, at the end of the, the meetings, when we are recording, we already get a, a folder with the chat and et cetera, et cetera. It's all coming automatically to your directory, Tom. Yeah. But anybody else can, if you see the chat window, there is a link for file. And if you click there, file in your computer and all, you can save it. Okay, guys, take care, everyone. This, this information will be posted. All the main links. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Have a good Bye. one. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Bye, Tom. Bye. Oh, like this.